Welcome everyone again to another in our series of interview with the experts. I'm very pleased uh, to have with me today, uh, Dr. Courtney Bennett, uh, who's the medical director of our cardiac intensive care unit and a consultant in the division of ischemic heart disease and CICU, as well as the division of cardiovascular ultrasound. I'm Malcolm Bell. I'm uh, the vice chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine uh, here in Rochester, uh, Minnesota. So welcome, Dr. Bennett. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so we're here to, uh, to talk about something that may sound as though it's new, but I, I don't think it really is. And, and that's POCUS or a point of care ultrasound. Um, maybe just start off with just telling us what exactly is POCUS and, and what sort of organ systems are, are we talking about uh, looking at uh, with uh, ultrasound at this point of care? Yeah, that's a great place to start. The way that we typically differentiate you know, echocardiography or ultrasound of other organ systems from point of care ultrasound is that POCUS, which we'll I'll use for, for short in point of care ultrasound, is actually a goal-directed exam. So when we're doing POCUS, we're actually trying to answer a specific uh, clinical question at the bedside um, or in the emergency department, um, wherever the patient may be located, in the, even in the operating room, to try and image multiple organ systems at the same time to put that together to answer that single clinical question. And so that's typically how we would differentiate that from a comprehensive echocardiogram. Or even the ultrasound. I mean, we, you right. talk about other systems. So looking at the abdomen, uh, so potentially talking about abdominal ultrasound or... Right, or right. Out. Yes, exactly. So with point of care ultrasound, we'll typically do any combination of cardiac, lung, abdomen, even vascular imaging. And for example, with echocardiography, in order to be considered a comprehensive echocardiography, there are certain components needed in the majority of the studies um, to be considered a comprehensive echocardiography, echocardiogram. But for POCUS, for example, if someone comes with shortness of breath, you may image the lungs for findings of fluid, look at the heart maybe to look for cardiac function or even strain on the right heart, and maybe then add vascular imaging to see if there's any evidence of a DVT. Putting that all together, normal lung ultrasound with maybe reduced right heart function and finding of DVT may lead you down the path to start heparin and do imaging for um, to confirm the diagnosis of PE. And that's just an example of how you can put it together. So today, I, I think you wanted to uh, confine your, your comments and you know, opinions here uh, with use of POCUS in the critical care environment. Correct. Um, but very often, your patient gets into the you know, uh, critical care or ICU or you know, cardiac intensive care unit because of findings of you know, ultrasound or, or, or POCUS. What are your thoughts here? Is the physical exam going to be mm -hmm. complemented by uh, POCUS or is it the other way around? Um, maybe just uh, spell out how you see this play in, in terms of you know, the, the physical exam and, and beyond. Right. I think this is a, a great debate. You know, many traditional um, providers will like to argue that it all comes down to the exam. And then there's another group who rely heavily on the uh, POCUS findings. I would say that really it's actually the POCUS that's complementing the clinical assessment. Um, so the clinical findings on your, even your history and exam are going to guide your POCUS imaging. Um, I will say that there is strong evidence to support the, the um, fact that POCUS does significantly improve clinical exam. For example, there's a study demonstrating that medical students plus POCUS actually outperformed cardiologists in identification of murmurs. So the cardiologists were using traditional exam skills and the medical students were using exam skills plus POCUS and they were able to identify the murmurs uh, significantly um, more accurately than the cardiologists without POCUS alone. Tell us, when do you think you'd be using this uh, in, in a typical patient that's going to be admitted to, to the cardiac intensive care unit or is already uh, in the uh, ICU? 
Yeah, so we will use actually any new admission to the cardiac ICU. Part of our admission um, workup, I'll say, is to perform POCUS on all of our patients. And so um, often patients presenting with undifferentiated shock or shortness of breath um, will start by doing POCUS and then see which direction the findings will actually take us. The POCUS exam can actually decrease the number of diagnostic studies by about almost 20% um, in terms of helping narrow down that differential diagnosis. So when the patient is admitted to the ICU, we'll perform our clinical assessment history, physical exam, and then perform POCUS um, following that. Sometimes it may be simultaneous depending on how many team members we have present, but that will always uh, follow the, the physical exam. Um, and I actually did a small um, feasibility study looking at um, when does it feel most convenient for clinicians to incorporate uh, POCUS um, using a NASA, NASA TLX survey in terms of assessing workload. And I compared in a simulation setting whether providers should do their POCUS exam after each system. So for example, examine the lungs and then do POCUS of the lungs or do the whole clinical exam and then perform the POCUS. And um, the providers felt strongly that the workload of performing it after the physical exam made more sense. Um, they didn't feel that they were fumbling between exam and POCUS. And so that was, uh, as I said, small study, but um, no one had ever looked at it before to see when it felt uh, like it made the most sense in the exam. So, so what are the most common things that you would be imaging? I mean, you just talked about the, the, uh, the lung exam, maybe you know, walk us through what you're looking for there, but what, what else would you be looking for? Yeah, so on the lung exam, we're looking for findings, specifically, um, if we're looking for pulmonary edema, we're looking for B lines, which are these um, comet tail artifacts that uh, greater than three or more in an in a imaging window would be um, consistent with abnormal aeration, at least in that segment. So you're looking for those B line artifacts, you can actually see on lung exam findings consistent with um, consolidation of the lung, which would suggest pneumonia, um, as well as even looking for pleural fluid. Um, if you're looking at the abdomen, one of the reasons that we most often in the cardiac ICU are going to look at the abdomen is to look for free fluid. Um, that could be related to trauma. And you might ask, well, why would a patient in the cardiac ICU have trauma? Well, actually, um, CPR itself can cause trauma and patients can have bleeding into the abdomen. So we'll look for findings of free fluid. In that same setting, if you're looking at the IVC and see the IVC is completely collapsed and you see free fluid in the abdomen, putting that together, we might say the patient has some type of laceration or injury. Um, also, patients have procedures and sometimes even spontaneously bleeding. Um, so those are some of the findings we would look at um, using abdominal ultrasound. Um, and finally, even looking at vascular ultrasound, we're trying to identify the veins, typically the femoral veins, even down into the more um, distal veins and look for the compressibility of the veins as a sign of potential DVT. So non-compressible would be consistent with DVT. Yeah, I mean, you know, trauma is not something we, you know, often consider uh, in the cardiac intensive care unit. But right. uh, I mean, I understand that your focus has been used on, you know, for, for some time in the emergency department. It's, it's, a, it's a very valuable tool there uh, right. uh, in, in trauma patients. And that's where it really was established, that FAST yeah. exam, um, which is the focused assessment using sonography and trauma. Yeah. But even just, um, you know, assessing the IVC, uh, I mean, outside of the setting of trauma, I mean, surely must give you an indication of what the volume status is of a patient, particularly if they're in shock and, or, you know, having your know, renal failure. Um, Correct. And then with, with the, uh, the, the lung uh, um, ultrasound, I mean, we typically don't think about ultrasound being used, uh, you know, in aerated uh, um, uh, organs, but... Mm -hmm. Is this something that is equivalent to a chest X-ray? Is it better than a chest X-ray for, let's say, identifying your pulmonary edema? Yes. So specifically looking for cardiac pulmonary edema, the sensitivity and specificity of the lung ultrasound is very good. 
um, above 90% uh, for both or near at least 90% for both. And actually in some settings has outperformed the chest X-ray in terms of the sensitivity and specificity. That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. So who's actually doing the, these POCUS exams? And, and so you, you said that when a patient comes into your cardiac intensive care unit, that this is really part of the admission process, you know, complementing the, the physical exam. Um, I mean, the, these are trainees that are doing this, the consultants. And, and, and tell us about what sort of training and perhaps even credentialing people will need, you know, to be able right. to, to do this. Yeah, and that's an ongoing um, topic of discussion, um, even within our institution as well as um, outside of that. So it depends on really who's present on the team with those skills. Uh, myself and some of my colleagues um, share both uh, the echo echocardiographer role as well as the cardiac intensive care um, unit provider role. And so that would include myself and a few other of our colleagues. Our fellows are also um, experienced in performing um, POCUS and there is a curriculum for them. Um, and, and I'm sure you're aware that our institution has supported um, providing um, handheld devices uh, for the fellows as part of their training. It's a little bit more straightforward um, for um, cardiology fellows in training because ultrasound is incorporated into their curriculum fairly heavily. Um, and our echo lab has begun performing lung ultrasound. So our fellows get experience with that as well. Um, in terms of overall credentialing, um, there the um, NBE has actually now a critical care uh, ultrasound exam that providers can sit for. Um, that does require that the, the non-cardiologists who are sitting for that exam have 150 studies that have been overread by an experienced echocardiographer before they're eligible to sit for the exam. But there are some credentialing processes such as this um, present or available, and this continues to be evolving. So if you, if you find that if we're using POCUS and, and there's a, a cardiac exam, and there's clearly an abnormality, you know, whether it's uh, you know pericardial effusion or um, you know some left ventricular dysfunction. Is that going to replace a, a formal transthoracic echocardiogram? And on the other hand, if uh, the interpretation is that the cardiac function appears to be normal, again, does that replace uh, the need for a transthoracic echocardiogram? Yeah, so I actually think it won't replace the need. I think it will reduce the number of overall imaging studies required, but I don't think that it's going to replace the um, echocardiogram itself completely, mainly because just assessing, for example, tamponade itself, it can be difficult at the bedside and someone who's not as experienced as a sonographer in terms of getting all those Doppler indices. Um, as well as the fact that many point of care or handheld ultrasounds don't have that Doppler capability. You know, if the patient is unstable and, and any 2D imaging would be able to provide you with evidence of chamber collapse, but if it's an early assessment of tamponade, you really need that additional data. And that's why I think you'll still be, you'll still be ordering the comprehensive echocardiogram, but maybe not the ultra or the CT scan or the Doppler as well, because you've narrowed it down. You've narrowed your differential diagnosis down and you can focus your imaging studies then. And what about in the at sites that uh, you know, don't have the resources that your know, large uh, hospitals or academic centers you know, have? And so I'm thinking about you know, a, a remote uh, hospital uh, in their emergency department or mm -hmm. in their small intensive care you know, surely this must provide an opportunity for real-time um, you know, review. And, and, and I know that at least you know, one or two of these devices you know, are cloud-based as well. And mm -hmm. so what, what are the opportunities there for us to, to help our colleagues you know, who are in these smaller uh, acute care hospitals? Yeah, so I don't actually personally have experience with this, but I do know something very interesting. Um, our emergency, emergency department has the capability through telemedicine to actually guide our referring um, health system sites in performing handheld um, ultrasound or POCUS while in real time to help with imaging and then see on the monitor 
um, those images to help with decision making. And so those capabilities do exist. Okay, well, I think we're that's running out of time here. Maybe the the last question I'll ask you, Dr. Bennett, is uh, do you see this as improving outcomes in, in patients? And do we have any data uh, to, to support that? And I'm talking specifically about yes. the intensive care patients. Yes. So this is this is one of my favorite you know soapboxes to get on because I think there's a lot of um, there's argument about the fact that point of care ultrasound itself probably does not improve outcomes. But my argument is that diagnostic studies themselves typically are not going to improve outcomes. It depends on what you do with the results of the diagnostic study. And so I typically will go back to one very strong study that I like to cite um, by Dr. Kanji. Um, and it was done in the emergency department where they scanned um, patients doing um, actually cardiac ultrasound and then IVC. And based on the findings, they actually had a, an intervention protocol. And so they were able to demonstrate um, actually less use of fluids in patients presenting with undifferentiated shock, as well as decreased um, uh, end organ damage as well, as well as, and most of the primary outcome was looking at uh, mortality. So it, if you are able to incorporate some kind of intervention protocol with your diagnostic imaging, then you're able to improve outcomes. Yeah, I think it's always difficult, isn't it, to, to demonstrate that you do improve outcomes, but you know, at the very least, you're know, making sure that those outcomes are not compromised, uh, mm -hmm. but whether you increase efficiency and maybe decrease um, you know, resource utilization. And, um, right. and then I think particularly uh, maybe coming to a diagnosis you know, sooner rather than later. And as I said, particularly in you know, those uh, smaller hospitals. So yep. I, I think these are really uh, helpful comments that, that you, you've made and uh, guiding us into, I think, what we're going to see in the next phase of uh, work in the, you know, the coronary care unit or the cardiac intensive care unit, you know, yes. building on the experience from the ED over many years. And, and so I, I think as we see, you know, increased utilization of POCUS, uh, I think that our viewers and listeners will, will find this very, very uh, interesting. But it's, I think it's going to be important for people to understand you still need to be sort of well-trained in this. And, um, and I look forward to hearing more about your efforts in, in that regard. So yes. thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bennett, for your time. Thank you.